Good afternoon, everyone. We'll let everybody uh, start to trickle into the, the Zoom uh, webinar room and we can get started in a few minutes. Just a little bit of, of housekeeping. Uh, we try to run through the, the panel and the discussion, um, but if you, as you have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, button on the bottom of the, uh, the Zoom window, and we will start to address those questions as we get toward the end. Um, so it's a pleasure to have everyone here today. Uh, in honor of Global Diversity Month, we thought it was a appropriate time to look about a look, look at how investment and innovation can address health inequities and move everyone more toward health equity for all. Um, I'm Lisa Placanica. I'm the Senior Managing Director for the Center for Technology Licensing at Wall Cornell Medicine, the Medical College of Cornell University of New York City. We're part of Wall Cornell Medicine Enterprise Innovation. Um, we host a series of panels that we call our special topics in healthcare, um, looking at a wide ranging uh, topics, and it's always a pleasure pleasure to have such a diverse panel of experts, both on the innovator side, the entrepreneur side, the investor side, and the academic side to help address some of these questions of how innovation can address healthcare challenges. Um, so today our panel, we're going to open up with Dr. Man Monica Safford giving an overview of sort of the scope of the problem and really level setting uh, the stage for, for the discussion to follow. After her brief presentation, we are introduce the panelists and get started in our discussion. Monica, welcome. Great, uh, let me share my screen and welcome all of you to this um, special panel. Um, let me see if I can get it to cooperate, thank you. Uh, so I always uh, mention my disclosures. I am the Chief of General Internal Medicine at Well Cornell and I also am the co-founder of the Cornell Center for Health Equity, which is a relatively young Center we were founded in 2018. I am the founder and owner of MedExplain, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. So I think one of the many shocking things about uh, COVID, this is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, was that it brought into the headlines in this country the amazing disparities um, in health outcomes that uh, characterize the United States of America. Um, but I, I've been studying health disparities my entire career, but I think a lot of Americans are not aware that uh, there are huge disparities in cancer outcomes, in heart attack, and in virtually every chronic condition that you want to look at, people of color do worse uh, than white people. And this is a very uncomfortable reality, uh, but we know why this is. Uh, so. Um, this is a, a, a slide from a lecture that Steve Schroeder gave. Steve Schroeder is a giant in my field, general internal medicine. Uh, he ran the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and formed the general internal medicine division at UCSF, which is still widely considered to be, if not the top GIM division, then certainly one of them. Um, and this reflects what sociologists and anthropologists believe are the major influences on health outcomes. And you'll notice as a physician, the first thing I noticed when I looked at this the first time was that healthcare is only given about a 10% share of this very large pie. Um, and that is worth noting because this has become the largest industry in this country. And we do have health disparities and we do have terrible health outcomes uh, compared to other uh, advanced economies. Um, and part of it could be that we're not investing and innovating in the spaces that have the greatest impact. So for example, social and environmental factors, this is where social determinants of health come in. And they then in turn very heavily impact individual behavior. So the 60% of the pie that we can impact uh, is the side where we have the least amount of investment and activity. And I think this is an enormous op opportunity for us. Uh, so how, how do we approach this problem? Well, the World Health Organization has done a great job of helping us to frame it. 
uh, they uh, several years ago formed a commission to come up with a an action oriented framework for the influences of social determinants of health on health outcomes and on health inequities. Um, and what they did is they studied the major frameworks that have been proposed over the years and they amalgamated them into this framework. And what we see are structural determinants on the left hand side that influence intermediary determinants that then in turn are the direct impact on health inequities. Uh, so we start all the way over on the left hand side with our laws and policies. Um, you know, I think most of us have heard of redlining this practice by uh, banks and real estate companies of not selling homes outside of very specified areas and denying loans to people, uh, which you know many people will look at that and say, well, that was then, this is now. Uh, we continue to have structural uh, decisions that perpetuate inequities in this country. And the most recent example or a recent example uh, is the CARES Act. Uh, so among the things that the CARES Act did to try to provide uh, support as a result of the pandemic was to reimburse hospitals. And they had to come up with a formula, how much is every hospital going to get? And unfortunately, the formula resulted in rich hospitals getting four times as much as the poorest hospitals where the, the, the patients overwhelmed the resources. So this is yet another example of how our structural decisions, our policy decisions, have an amazing impact on uh, the, the well being of our people, and specifically uh, the people who, in this second box here of the structural determinants, are the ones who uh, struggle with socioeconomic position as a result. Uh, the social class, largely determined by gender and ethnicity. Uh, this concept of intersectionality, Black women in this country are worth paying separate attention to because their health outcomes are really atrociously bad. Um, uh, the limitations of educational attainment, the kinds of jobs people get, the kinds of income that they can uh, generate as a result of policies like redlining, um, leads to their material circumstances, their behaviors, uh, this is where the intersection between social determinants and behaviors comes in and the psychosocial factors. And notice how the health system is this little box uh, down in the right hand corner here, but nevertheless, a very important influence on health and well being. I'd like to get, share with you four innovations that uh, work all over this roadmap uh, to show you just how innovators can make a big impact. The first is NowPow. Now POW works at the intersection of the uh, services and the social structures that we have and the individuals. It was formed by Stacey Lindau as part of a CMMI um, Healthcare Innovation Award. Uh, she um, studied health, Healthy RX and eventually founded this company. And now Now POW uh, is all over the country in major metro metropolitan areas. And its basic purpose is to plug people into the services that they are eligible for. This is a huge problem. This is a wonderful innovation. It really helps people who are eligible for services get them, uh, which has been a real problem for most municipalities where a lot of eligible people never get uh, the services. But you have the person sitting in front of you, you call up NowPow, and you can plug them into the nearest place where they can apply for these services. Uh, the second example I'd like to share with you is in telehealth. In telehealth works at the intersection between the health system and the individual. And it was founded by Catherine Saunders. Uh, she is an obesity medicine specialist and uh, was until August at Weill Cornell, but now works full time for in telehealth. Um, she looks at obesity, which is one of the biggest disparate problems uh, where people of color um, have much more obesity than uh, white people. And they use a novel telemedicine approach and a proven approach to uh, treating obesity, like the health condition that it is. It's not just a reflection that people can't control themselves. It's a disease that needs treatment. Um, and they focus on low cost on formulary options so they can reach Medicaid populations. Um, MedExplain is my company. Uh, my company focuses on health literacy. And so it is uh, 
trying to address this problem of low educational attainment among the very people who need health care the most. Uh, what we do is uh, activate patients through simple language, visuals, videos, diverse characters, and real world situations. Um, Kayaba Care, uh, this is the last example that I will give you. Kayaba Care was uh, founded by Mary Fleming. Uh, she's an obstetrician who noticed that we have unacceptably high maternal and infant mortality in this country, largely borne by Black women. Uh, she created this company that offers virtual doulas covered by Medicaid. You'll notice that their entire team are people of color. And it is no accident that all these uh, companies that I've shared with you are all uh, founded by women um, and founded by people who noticed the problems while they were taking care of patients and while they were working within the healthcare system uh, to try to innovate and provide solutions to help. Uh, so you can see you can target multiple nodes in this roadmap. Um, and with multiple innovations uh, can make a big difference. A good way to think about this is this cartoon that the Vermont State Department of Health uses where you can see some people can't reach the apples and if you put them up on crates, uh, they can. Um, and that I think is where the innovation is needed is we need many people to innovate around how to help people get up on crates so that everybody has an equal shot at reaching the apples. Uh, so that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. I'll hand it back over to Lisa and I very much look forward to hearing from the panelists. Okay, thank you, Monica, for that introduction and, and overview. I think that sets the stage nicely for, for a good dialogue amongst our panelists. Um, I'd like each panelist to take a, a minute to introduce themselves and, and their area of expertise. Uh, let's start with uh, Rachel. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Rachel Rubin. Uh, I lead the Investments and Programs at Royvent Social Ventures, which is a public charity spin-out from the biopharma company Royvent Sciences. We combine industry expertise with our philanthropic mission, and that's focused on increasing access to medical care and to medicines for low-income countries and for underserved communities. We do that through two primary levers. One is making investments in biotech manufacturing technologies that allow medicines to get to low-income countries, that lower the cost of medicine production, and also lower reliance on global supply chains by creating the ability for local in-country drug manufacturing and workforce training on the ground in communities. The second lever is focused on um, leadership, specific to diverse leadership at pharma companies, at biotechs, and at healthcare companies. Uh, and we focus on partnering with academic institutions and providing specific unique educational opportunities that are focused on hands-on drug development to help diverse uh, high, uh, high talent uh, leaders uh, achieve the ability to access C-level and board uh, opportunities and board positions at a much quicker pace than historically. And we believe that this is a primary driver that will lead to health equity in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Pierre? Oh, thanks, Lisa, and absolutely delighted to be here. I'm Pierre Theodore. I'm a Vice President of Global Public Health at the pharmaceutical company Johnson & Johnson. I should say pharmaceutical and medical devices, and I lead a program in global health equity within our global public health group. That group is responsible for five franchises in HIV, TB, soil transmitted helminthic or worm disease, uh, global surgery and pandemic preparedness in low and middle income countries. Uh, we do so by commercializing assets from across Johnson & Johnson and then invest, investing aggressively in assets that we think are, that are appropriate for low and middle income environments, in particular to overcome barriers of access and availability and affordability. Uh, we do so through a 170 person team that's across 22 countries, again, largely focused on LMICs broad Broadly, but in particular Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. So delighted to be with you and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Martin? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Martin Mendoza, and I serve as the Director of Health Equity for the All of Us Research Program um, at the National Institutes of Health. Um, for anyone not familiar with what All of Us is, it is a, it's a national effort to enroll um, 1 million or more people from all walks of life. Um, and, and so really, um, Program A is still one of the largest, um, most diverse uh, databases of health information that researchers can use to study um, health and illness. Um, oftentimes, 
many communities have been unrepresented in biomedical research, and therefore the advances that, that come from that research, they haven't always benefited the communities as much as they could. And so really the goal of the program is to include everybody. Um, therefore, the title, all of us, um, thanks uh, to the organizers for the invitation to be here and delighted to um, be part of this panel. Thank you. Kevin Hi, thank you for having me. I'm Javen A. Santos. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the CEO and co-founder of MyLua Health, which is a digital maternal care service that predicts and manages risk of maternal comorbidities and complications. Our mission is to reduce maternal morbidity and advance health equity for all burden people. I have a background in entrepreneurship, strategy, community organizing, and holistic wellness. I received my MBA from Cornell Tech this past May. Um, post receiving my undergraduate degree in accounting, I took over a failing bodega in which I successfully exited. And in my three years there, I was exposed to the true definition of disparities and systemic inequities from food and care deserts to drug addiction and broadly severe lack of services um, to meet the needs of the community. My lived experience is one of an Afro-Latina living in the United States who has many privileges, such as her MBA from Cornell, um, a supportive family and partner, means to support my basic needs, while also the, having the lived experience and exposure to discrimination, microaggressions, being under-resourced and underfunded. My narrative is complex, like many of the individuals that we serve. And yeah, thank you for having me. And I look forward to hearing the insights of my fellow panelists. Hey, thank you all. Um, so Chivine, I think I'll start with, with you with the first question. In our prep session, you brought up a really interesting concept of how you look at your solution as a zip code by zip code solution and addressing disparities in the needs of populations on that micro level. Can you speak a little bit more about what that means and how that impacts um, how you look at innovation development and product development? Absolutely. So with our solution, um, we know that social risk factors are vital in understanding the holistic well-being of each birthing person. And as such, when we have created our algorithms, they input the variables of zip code, for instance, and also a perceived need on behalf of the mother. So by getting very granular in our approach and understanding that zip code by zip code, will, the needs will vary um, amongst the people that are being served, we've been able to understand the weight of each variable going into at the, the community level. So it's important to understand what the community needs, what resources they're lacking. And then also the last bit is really understanding how they resonate with those needs that are being addressed. It's not enough to just identify the need, but confirmation that each individual resonates with whatever um, need is being identified. So they accept whatever resources are being given and also the solutions are being tailored according to those specific needs. Rachel, you had mentioned something similar in our prep session, but I think you used the term sidewalk by, by sidewalk. Um, does Roy Van Social Ventures, when they're looking at um, innovative solutions, look for innovators who are solving problems on a, on a small geographic basis based on the specific population? Absolutely. And I think that this is a really important concept that will probably come up a few times in our discussion. So I think there is a big a big need to understand in each local community, what are the specific issues and how those change sidewalk by sidewalk and then addressing those in a way that is culturally relevant to each community and, and really to each person. Javen A mentioned something really important as well, which is getting feedback. Getting feedback from people who are patients in a specific situation and saying to them, does this resonate with you? Why or why not? And then tailoring technological innovations and solutions to actually address the concerns that are then raised in an iterative way that includes patient feedback and makes people um, you know, actually able to accept the medical care, the medicine, and kind of create much more of a holistic ecosystem um, that I think will lead to lowering disparities in healthcare outcomes ultimately. Um, 
so that that kind of sidewalk by sidewalk component, I think, is um, imperative in how we address uh, healthcare equity issues globally. Pierre Martin, do you yeah, want to maybe jump I in could on just, this topic? Yeah, I, I do. I think because there's a very important um, potential tension here, which is that inequities are often experienced locally and often are solved locally, and yet broad investment is usually with a mind of what is capable of scaling broadly. And so it's important to understand what are the needs on individual basis, but then to, to learn themes and develop models that in turn can be applicable, indeed sidewalk to sidewalk, but also market to market, integrated delivery network to integrated delivery network. So part of the challenge in health equity is having almost two minds, sort of thinking locally, but thinking about how the technology or the innovation could be scaled broadly to broadly impact health disparities. One of the things I thought was interesting in, in Monica's opening remarks was all the way on the left-hand side was sort of the concept of public policy being a main driver of solving some of these issues. Um, Martin, can you talk a little bit about your work at the NIH and how sort of the how how the government is approaching trying to start to address some of these issues? There, there we go. Yep, happy to, um, Lisa. So you know. Um, uh, broadly, you know, um, President Biden has made, you know, to no one's here surprise, um, health equity uh, a very um, high level priority for the entire administration. So not just following the NIH or just to, to HHS. Um, and, you know, you can really see it um, in a number of ways across the department. You know, for example, my uh, my colleagues at FDA, where I, where I formerly worked, you know, are um, have many efforts on uh, increasing clinical trial diversity. Um, and here at um, the NIH, we have, um, we also have num numerous efforts from, I'm sure you heard of our, our UNITE initiative, um, you know, our, our SEAL um, initiative, um, as well as the All of Us Research Program. And, you know, so as I talked about it at All of Us, um, we are uh, uh, attempting to build a, a 1 million uh, plus large database that reflects the diversity of the U.S. Um, currently, we have um, about 50% uh, about of our participants are uh, self-identified as racial and ethnic minorities um, with, with, a, uh, with an overall 80% um, um, that we call unrepresented biomedical research. This not only includes racial and ethnic um, minorities, but also sexual and gender minorities, those who live in rural populations, those with um, disabilities, low access to care, low educational attainment. Um, you know, so uh, when you combine all those categories together, about 80% of our um, of our cohort um, is uh, what we term underrepresented by medical um, research. Um, looking, looking more broadly, the you know, you mentioned public policy, and I really think as far as the federal government is concerned, that's really, you know, the main way that I think we can assist in, in health equity. So I think I, I see um, a large responsibility and a large role for the federal government in creating and disseminating um, that policy, but also in creating and disseminating resources um, and then leaving it to academia and the private sector, um, folks like uh, Pierre's company, Johnson Johnson, to really take the ball from there and then to use those resources and that policy so they can do their work to advance health equity. So really, you know, I think everyone has a, a role to play and it's going to take, uh, you know, just to borrow my program statement and all of us approach to, to really get us to where we need to be. Great, Monica, similar to that, you, you, know, you clearly set the, the the public policy is a critical component of solving these issues, but how do you see the private sector sort of playing or where does it fit into uh, the role of helping to address health inequities and the interplay between public and private partnerships? You know, it's a really great question. Um, it, it, to some extent, it really depends on the um, the motivation of the private sector. 
um, because there's uh, there's such a bottom line motivation a lot of times in companies, especially during the early startup phase, uh, that it's it can be difficult to stick to the original motivations for starting the company uh, because you're being so pressured to generate uh, generate not only revenue but profit. Um, and that can get in the way uh, because a lot of the things that are needed are not revenue generating. Um, so then you have to try to look for philanthropy and there's only so much of that to go around and the recent stock market uh, doesn't make philanthropists very generous. So um, it's very, very challenging. Um, uh, you know, looking to align incentives so that there's more incentive for private companies to do what is needed in order to um, advance health equity would be really, really important. Um, but it is, you know, we're really asking a lot of private companies to basically take a financial hit uh, um, in many cases because reimbursement for a lot of the services that are needed um, is so skewed. Um, you know, we have public reimbursement is a fraction of what commercial uh, reimbursement is. And that that is something that a private company really cannot address. So I, I think there's a lot of really good hearted people out there who are trying their best, um, but it's usually at the expense of profit margin. Um, and that is that is just a gigantic hurdle uh, to overcome. Martin, it looks like you have some thoughts to share on the intersection of public and private uh, partnerships. Yes. Um, so um, I just wanted to add that I think, um, you know, I think what what um, what Monica said, you know, um, can often be the case, but but I I also think that um, we need to um, we need you know those of us in the academic and the government sectors we also need to uh, take it upon ourselves to to make the case to the private sector that um, health equity is you know, is not just something that is, you know, something that's morally, um, you know, correct, or it's just the right thing to do. But there are business case um, sort of positives to that. And I think it's our job to, to make the private sector aware of that. So for example, during my time at FDA, um, one of the things I heard quite often was that it was um, expensive to uh, enroll, um, uh, self-identified minorities in, into clinical research um, trials. And, and so my, what, one of my responses was always, we know that in 2045, you know, the U.S. Census has, pre has predicted that um, the United States will be a minority majority population. And so when that happens, um, you can imagine now all of a sudden, you know, if enrollment in, in clinical research doesn't change if it continues to look like what it does now, that you're going to have um, uh, medical products that come from the from this research that, um, you know, are not representative of the United States population as a whole, and um, not, not even the majority. And, and so what that can lead is to adverse events and, um, and financial losses. Um, you can imagine if someone has to pull a product off the market, you know, how much that would cost, um, you know, millions, billions of dollars. And, and so, you know, my case has always been, we know where we're going to end up. So it is in your financial best interest to figure this out now instead of later, um, you know, when it's, when it's almost too late. Um, and, and so doing it now is going to save your company millions, billions of dollars moving forward. Um, and I think to Monica's point, you know, offering appropriate incentives, um, that is one uh, potential uh, way to, to help that along. Um, also, I, I would say that, um, you know, when I started um, at FDA back in 2014, you know, meeting with the various um, pharmaceutical companies, you know, there were, there were not a lot of folks um, that were interested in, um, I wouldn't say not interested, but there just weren't a lot of folks, you know, specifically working on health equity and, and enrolling diverse populations in, into research. Um, and then when I, when I look at it, you know, you know, there may be like one or two people per, 
company, if that. And now when I look at when I look at it now, every major pharmaceutical company and even some of the smaller ones, they all have teams of people dedicated to this effort. And, and so while the numbers may not have moved quite significantly, you know, um, as far as research participation goes for, in, for minorities, um, I, I think this is a step in the right direction. And now that we have teams of people working on this issue and, and companies are dedicating lots of funding to these efforts. And so I definitely see that as a step in the right direction and a sign of progress. Rachel. I'd like to come up from the investor side of, you know, are you looking just at cash return on your investment or are there other factors at play? So I think this is a really important point. So first of all, Martin, I agree with everything you're saying so strongly on a diverse clinical trial population, or I should say clinical trial population that just more accurately reflects the population of any specific disease. Uh, and that's certainly an effort that we're focused on and thinking about at Roy Gensler Centers. That aside, I think there is a really big need for alignment, not just with entrepreneurs and how they are thinking about approaching um, you know, healthcare disparities through technological innovation, but with the investors, you know, whether it's venture capital or other pools of capital, and also with their board of directors, right? So if you're an entrepreneur putting together your board or thinking about what capital to accept, being aligned on a long-term vision that allows for you know, a longer period of time potentially that's not revenue generative or a smaller potential exit because of the specific community you're targeting, but then can really think about how to be inclusive much more so on a long-term pathway towards reducing healthcare inequities and to including low-income communities in the solution. Um, it, you know, those are the primary criteria I think about when looking at any technology is Will this create a significant change in the current disparity of health equity? And if the technology doesn't check the box or if the entrepreneur leading the specific technology doesn't really speak to the importance of that in their own mission, then this specific investment isn't the right one for right against social ventures because we do take that long-term perspective. We are willing to accept a slightly lower return. I shouldn't say slightly, a lower return in exchange for reducing health inequity the return we then receive goes on to fund the next technology, right? Or a philanthropy, we don't return capital to investors. We reinvest it again and again. And we really look at ourselves as that type of, you know, venture capital or venture charity approach that can really be aligned in how to think about reducing health inequities over the long term. Yeah, Rachel, I may um, add on top of that. I, I'm very much aligned with your point of view is that we've taken for a very large, you know, the largest diversified healthcare company in the world, we've taken a strategy with early stage entrepreneurs of actually asking them directly about the technology and its potential application to address a health disparity. It's not gating to deal flow. That is, it doesn't determine whether or not we invest, but it very much is taken into consideration in terms of the deals that we look at, the relationships that we're trying to build. And because as you mentioned, larger companies often have a blend of different if you will, buckets of capital that they can apply. There is often investment capital that is more social impact that's available for organizations that are really dedicated to health disparity. So, so we're very much in alignment with that view. I might also add that, um, you know, while we struggle with the, the sort of the dollar, you know, issue or driver to addressing health disparities is that health inequity is the significant driver of healthcare expenditures in the United States going forward. It, without a doubt, we are looking at three or $400 billion a year of additional healthcare expenditures that derive from differences in population healthcare outcomes. So before I went to J&J, for example, um, you know, I was a cardiothoracic surgeon, I was on faculty for 15 years at UCSF, and then at, still I'm on faculty at Stanford, we would occasionally have patients come to the emergency room HIV, or sorry, excuse me, IV drug using mitral valve or tricuspid valve disease, extremely expensive to deliver care to these patients. Whereas relatively simple social cultural interventions could have prevented it. I think recognizing that as a untapped value in healthcare and a, unfortunately, a expenditure driver has become increasingly recognized. So we look for technologies that can address these these important cost drivers that we face in healthcare systems. 
Jimena, I'd like to ask your your take on this from an entrepreneur who's fundraising and, and engaging with investors. Like, does it change how you, for lack of a good word, pitch your technology and your solution? And does it change the types of investors that you are looking to work with? Absolutely. Um, as someone who's currently raising, um, we've been pushed in so many directions. A lot of investors are like, go after the sexy product for the affluent mom that can pay for it right now um, instead of addressing the disparities. And what we've done is we're building for the most marginalized communities, understanding that we're capturing everyone above by solving the hardest issue. So for us, we've made it a priority to not deprioritize the group that is suffering the most. And instead we're leading with that and really understanding our customers because we, we have to look at it and our end users, which are birthing people um, overall, but we have to look at it and understand that the populations that are not being served, um, and to Pierre's point, are also costing the system the most, are also the ones that are not being, that are not engaging. So by really getting down to what is going to move the needle on uh, whether it's trust, access, and just understanding the overall needs of these populations, we're better able to solve. So for us, we've been finding and looking for VCs and angel investors that understand the mission, that um, really empathize with what we're trying to deliver to the healthcare system and the, the crisis that we're looking to solve for. So we've definitely made sure that we're not deprioritizing what is important and it's that everyone's included in the narrative and we've been well received and are finding investors that actually see value and understand that there is a return on your investment for doing well and for doing right by all groups of people. Monica, as an entrepreneur, is that a similar experience that you've seen where investors want you to focus on, I'll call it a more lucrative market, which is not necessarily the, the mission and the the problem that your innovations are trying to solve and how do you kind of address that with, with the investors? Well, um, you know, my company is still in the very, very early stages of fundraising. So we're still in our seed round and um, have yet to get any nipples. Um, and I think that this is one of the biggest challenges for young companies is to get that first person to jump in the deep end and then the rest seem to follow. But, um, you know, we haven't had anybody who wants to go swimming in our pool so far. Um, if anybody's interested, I'm all ears and very happy to speak with you. Um, but, you know, we are looking for, I, I think what happens is that, you know, you talk to a lot of different people and we haven't been openly dissuaded, but I do get the sense that, you know, people, um, are not necessarily as enthusiastic or investors, um, you know, a lot of whom are not really that well versed in this space. And, you know, Pierre, what you talked about is that the excess costs of the healthcare system that are really pouring into um, health inequities. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the biggest challenge that I see is that there's no one uh, group that feels the impact of that. Um, you know, you have a, a, a large healthcare system like Medicare, obviously, at, at the state level, you have the state level Medicaid, uh, but private, uh, you know, venture capitalists, they're not really taking that large national view. They're sort of just looking for this particular company and how does this particular company fit into this market and sometimes even regionally. Um, so it's, uh, it, it is difficult, um, uh, you know, to get a lot of people talk this talk, not a lot of people walk the walk, at least yeah. not yet. It's a great, it's a great point, Monica. I couldn't agree more. I do, however, think that we're also seeing a um, evolution of the healthcare landscape where what was traditionally seen as a payor and a provider are often coming together so that you have the same person that's responsible for, you know, the organization that's responsible for paying for healthcare delivery also largely delivering it. And there, and you find a stronger motivation to make sure that costs are contained aggressively. Um, and one, one specific, you know, real world example is that we work closely with the largest for-profit healthcare um, hospital system in the United States called Healthcare, Health Corporation of America, or HCA. 
And Johnson & Johnson HCA have, have partnered publicly, our CEOs have partnered publicly because HCA came to us and, and we agreed with them that we have recognized significant health disparities in the populations that we serve. So at once they are delivering care, they're responsible for cost containment and under, recognizing that health disparity is a major driver of that. And that has been the incentive for a pharmaceutical company to partner directly with the healthcare delivery system, the hospital system, in order to address health disparities, in this case, specifically addressing lung cancer. Martin, one thing you had mentioned is you saw a, you know, a, a large difference between 2014 when you joined the FDA and now and some of the approaches to um, addressing health inequity and expanding clinical trial access and things like that. What do you, what do you attribute to some of the drivers in a, in a more focused interest in this area? over the past, you know, five to 10 years? Yeah, so um, great question, um, Lisa. I think, um, you know, I, I would be remiss if, if I didn't um, say, you know, that, um, you know, the murder of George Floyd and, you know, sort of this racial awakening that I feel like this country is currently experiencing over the past two, three years, um, I think have been, you know, really big, um, big drivers um, of, of um, you know, uh, sort of this uh, enhanced consciousness around disparities. Um, you know, to, to be clear, as everyone here knows, you know, disparities and lack of equity have, you know, these are problems that have been around since the beginning of time, really. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's nothing, and when it comes to health, those disparities are, are, it's nothing new here that, you know, anyone here hasn't, isn't already aware of. Um, but I think one of the things that COVID really did was that it um, it really brought to light um, you know the disparities you know that you know communities of color were experiencing when it when it came to COVID you know lack of, of resources um, you know lack of information um, you know they were often the ones that you know were in those frontline jobs um, you know that were often you know at higher risk for contracting the the um, the virus, you know, they experienced higher levels of, of cases, of hospitalizations, of deaths. You know, this has all been well documented um, by, by various um, agencies and entities. And, and so I think, you know, what, what this really has done is, is it's brought this um, awareness um, to both the private and the public sector, you know, beyond those of us that, that were already focused on it and, you know, elevated more in, into the public consciousness and, you know, so I, I definitely, you know, if anything good has come from COVID, you know, I, I think it's this uh, enhanced awareness of these, um, of, of these inequities. And, and I think we're now starting to see um, both uh, government, academia, um, and the private sector, you know, start, start, start to move on, on, on this, on this newfound awareness. And I'll remind the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the, the Q&A and we can address them as, as they come up and, and make sure we, we touch base on those topics that you have particular interest in, in hearing about. Uh, Rachel. Thank you. So, um, so I think what Martin said is just it, it really extremely interesting and relevant, right? So how to take some lessons over the last several years and utilize it for go forward investment in technologies that can really um, you know, increase access to medical care. And something specific that I found um, you know, in kind of translating how to think about go forward investment was the emergence of telehealth as a mode for care, as well as remote technologies. Um, and this was something that I think kind of existed before COVID, but then COVID just really brought it to the forefront in a way that you know, couldn't be ignored, right? So, you know, everyone to an extent during COVID was, was in their home. And I think it made us really recognize that for people that have issues that keep them into their home permanently, we need to really develop diagnostics, progression markers, and ways for these people to access medical care that was just truly unrecognized or not recognized to the right extent beforehand. And this is a combination of clinical workers that can come to the home, but then really technologies that allow those clinical workers to potentially even function as a physician utilizing you know, AI technologies, et cetera, 
um, or the types of diagnostics and progression markers that you know, can either be utilized by the individual themselves, by a caregiver, or by a clinician that can visit the home. And I think this is a theme or a trend that we'll see going forward. It's certainly something that I've you know, been recognizing the types of investments we look at. And my hope is that this can really longer term lower health inequity um, through investment and, and through a focus on this that was just really catapulted through the COVID experience we all had. Here, maybe I'll follow up that question with you. So to, I agree, telehealth and technology, I mean, you realize how powerful it can be, you know, in solving, I'll say, problems within the U.S. within our own back, backyard. Um, are those the same sorts of technological advances here in sort of low and middle to income countries that you think that will also have a major impact on health inequities on that global scale? You know, I think the innovations often differ depending on the degree of resource in different uh, healthcare environments. I, I think the thought process of how we think through opportunities is quite similar. Understanding what are the sort of the psychosocial um, resources and barriers that are faced by populations, what are the legal and political and economic and social frameworks that, that drive inequities, and having a sort of a deep understanding of the differences from one population to another, whether it's at a national, tribal, zip code street level, that sort of thinking is very similar in high resource and low resource environments, but the sorts of technologies that we're seeing ar arise, I think are variable. That, that said, I actually personally think that health technology has a very strong role to play in low and middle income country environments. We are investing aggressively in everything from educational platforms to uh, last mile delivery technologies for cold chain elements, all of which we think are important technical issues with the tail end of delivery of drugs and devices. But it goes back, I think, to Monica's point earlier that that tail end, if you will, if you think of it as a, a, a process from those political and economic drivers all the way down to healthcare, that is a small overall fraction of what drives health inequity. It's, it's thinking upstream that is often the, the main driver. And in that case, I'm not sure that necessarily health technology is the major solve. They, they lie in that domain of politics, economics, and policy that we spoke to earlier. So we have a question that came in from the audience, and Monica, maybe I'll, I'll ask you to address it because um, your your innovation solution is really dealing with you know health literacy for patients on a level that they understand it. The specific question is how financial literacy plays a role in in health equity and how that can possibly be addressed. I, I think that's a critical thing. I mean, you know, this is the the generational wealth, the robbing, systematic robbing of a group of people of generational wealth, I think includes uh, the reality that, um, you know, what you learn about uh, finances and how to manage finances is not something that's typically taught in schools. Uh, or in colleges. So you learn it from your social network or your family. Um, and of course, that's uh, where we have systematically intervened to keep that from happening. So that level of experience is often absent. Um, the innovation that I have does not directly address financial literacy, but there's a lot of programs. Again, this goes to NowPow. Um, there are a lot of programs available to people who to learn about financial literacy. Um, and I think one of the biggest uh, needs is to help people to avoid credit card debt um, and to avoid uh, the kinds of loan um, opportunities that spring up in the poorest neighborhoods where they have, you know, they're essentially loan sharks, um, extraordinarily high um, uh, uh, interest rates and, and very, very draconian measures. So, this is this confluence where um, you know rents are higher in poor neighborhoods, food is not available. Um, it's exactly like what Pierre said. You know, those are the innovations that we really need. Um, yes, health technology is definitely an area where we need um, innovation, but the social innovations are really where the dire needs are: is to connect people with the services that they need, such as uh, financial literacy programs. I think most people. It, you know, sort of just trying to get through their day. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's very hard for people who grow up in a financially sound, 
uh, environment in a suburb to really understand what it's like to live in poverty and not know where the meal of your children is coming from. Uh, the last thing you think about is healthcare in that kind of an environment. So I think really refocusing the attention and focusing much more attention on how to help people overcome the social adversity that they are trying to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think financial literacy is a very, very big part of that. But programs do exist. Um, it's plugging people into them and uh, educating them about where they, where they can access those kinds of services. That's where we need some innovation for sure. Martin, do you have an additional uh, view or comments to share on this point? Yes. Um, so my comment, it's not not specific to um, financial literacy, but um, but just uh, you know really big picture in the sense that um, you know in order for us to achieve health equity, you know this isn't just a a health you know sort of sector problem. You know if if we if we really want to achieve health equity, it's always been my view that in order to get that done, you know um, health equity has sort of you know these these intersections with uh, with, with, uh, with, with the larger society. So that means if you want health equity, you also need to pair it with um, education reform, um, housing reform, um, criminal justice reform, um, and I think financial reform as, as well. You know, if, if we just focus on sort of the health centric aspects of health equity, you know, I don't think we're never really going to get there. It has to be sort of this all of the above approach um, for for all these other areas that are that are really um, drivers and contributors of um, of health inequity. Great. I think we're we're coming near the end. I want to make sure anybody in the audience can ask some questions. Um, Pierre, you you have your your hand up to share some thoughts. Oh, you're on mute. Just very quickly, I wanted to go back to um, a couple of the comments that were made by Dr. Safford and Jivene um, earlier, which is that about you know what are the sources of capital, and you know sometimes I think as a as a someone who's sat on the early stage entrepreneur side, sort of the mid stage investor, and now in a strategic organization investing, it, it can be difficult to say well what is the what's the road in and what are the sources of capital. And I just wanted to put a couple of ideas out on the table and maybe encourage all of our all over the panelists to do so. You know, we've launched an incubator that's really focused on health disparities um, called J Labs in Washington, DC, where when we have both virtual and in-person um, uh, membership in this platform for innovation, which often brings support and allows to connect into investors and you know really creates a community around entrepreneurs that are focused on disparities. So I would encourage any entrepreneur listening to consider following up with that strategy. And the other is um, Johnson & Johnson Social Impact Ventures, which is a social impact investing fund, probably not too dissimilar from, from Rachel's efforts in which we do take this sort of triple bottom line of economic returns, environmental returns, and social returns into consideration in making investments. So I just wanted to make sure I left the listeners with some practical thoughts about sources of capital. Thank you. Shivani? Thank you for that, Pierre, and um, Rachel as well, as giving insights into really the investment side of things. I also think it's important to note just the disparity that comes with VC investment. So Black women receive a half a percent, a half of 1% of all VC capital, yet they are the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs that actually resonate in our part of the groups that are facing these disparities. So it's important to really understand and acknowledge that fact and then also make sure a targeted approach to empower uh, Black women and entrepreneurs to really to build on the solutions that they're innovating for within the communities that they exist. Um, so I appreciate, um, Pierre, definitely thank you for um, your tidbit on what you're doing at J Labs and the opportunities there. 
this has been a fantastic panel. I'd like to end off with each panelist sharing what they see as one of you know the biggest opportunities um, in solving this this large problem, as well as one of what's one of the biggest challenges or hurdles hurdles they see. So I'm just going to go around Robin and how everybody's on the my my screen. So Monica, would you like to start, please? Yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, community engagement and capacity building. So you know, the more we can um address Jevenet's um uh, comment um to really open some coffers uh, the best solutions come from within the community not from uh top down or outside um and these very deep insights into what is going to work in the in the community um i think we really need to fast track uh figuring out how to encourage um these extraordinarily gifted and talented uh, women who are stepping forward to make their communities better. I worked for 15 years in the Alabama Black Belt, and it was my absolutely great privilege to work with the women there who cared so much about their communities. Um, they're experts. Um, we should be investing in them. Thank you, Monica. Rachel. Uh, so, so slightly aligned with um, with Monica's comments. You know, I, I think. I think a longer term solution is investing in diverse leadership in a way that does not exist today um, of entrepreneurial technological innovations, but then also of biotech companies, of pharma companies, of healthcare companies, um, as well as their board of directors and, and those making the investments uh, into private organizations. I think that this, you know, this is a top down solution, but I think this type of top down solution brings a cultural and socioeconomic recognition and understanding of the power um, of different types of individuals that is just not recognized today and how budgets are allocated and how investments are made. Thank you, Rachel. Pierre. I would probably end up with just a word of encouragement to say that traditionally, when we think about healthcare value, we've thought about uh, cost and quality and access as being the three major drivers of value. And I would say that most healthcare systems are acknowledging increasingly so the importance of health of equity, the distribution of healthcare assets across populations as being a very important driver of healthcare value. So to the degree in, in pitches and in discussions with potential investors, you can really tap into the fact that healthcare systems are, are struggling with how to equitably distribute healthcare delivery and products and services. And that becomes kind of the basis for the, the pitch effectively. I just want to sort of suggest a word of encouragement that there is a hunger to address these health inequities in our systems from the standpoint of the entrepreneur. Thank you. Martin. First of all, thanks again for the opportunity to be a, be a part of this panel. Um, I'm going to piggyback on what um, Monica um, said. I, I really think to achieve health health equity, um, one of, if not the most critical parts is um, community engagement. Because I, I really feel that we have to have this um, local first approach. It's definitely not gonna be a one size fits all. And 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 so, you know, we really need to um, value the, um, the input and the expertise of our local communities and those local leaders and let them be our trusted voices and our guides um, to let us know what their communities need and 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 then you know follow what they say um i think only once we we do that and um will we be able to really start to move the needle on health equity Chimene. oh my goodness so um monica um and martin definitely summed up a lot of what i was going to say um really empowering the communities that are being served by opening up a feedback loop and also investing in community-based organizations that understand at a grassroots level what issues need to be addressed. And then also making this process iterative, going back to the community and ensuring that it's being they're being served in the right way that's culturally competent um, and that's equitable across the board. So investment in these technologies that are that are enabling need identification and verification and um, the influx of capital with community-based organizations is what I would say. Well, thank you to our panelists. It's been a very engaging and for me, enlightening conversation. Um, I hope all of our attendees have enjoyed today's discussions. If you have any questions, 
please feel free to reach out and we can try to get them addressed. Um, as a reminder, the Center for Technology Licensing for Cornell University and Mall Cornell Medicine Enterprise Innovation puts together programming year-round covering various topics touching upon intellectual property, innovation, entrepreneurship, and timely topics uh, such as health equity. Um, so please keep your eye out for future programming. And if you have any suggestions or, gee, I would love to learn about X, um, send them along and we're happy to put together bespoke uh, programming to address those needs. So again, thank you for the panelists. I think this was a, a really nice discussion that we've had today. Thank you. Thank you.